Good evening. It's seven o'clock and we want to rock. Uh, I'm Randy Minotaur. I am your fearless leader uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, I, and I am uh, uh, happy to be back at a monthly meeting. I haven't been at one now in, since April because in May we were in Texas birding and in September I was the PR director for the Rochester Fringe Festival. Heaven help me. Uh, so very glad for, that my life is returning to normal now. Uh, so great to see you. Uh, who's seen some great birds? You seeing cool stuff out there? Oh, did you see the nice. brand up on up, up at Somerville? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, that's I heard 18 brands at Somerville Pier today. Um, anyone else getting out seeing stuff around locally? Yeah, go ahead, Derek. Wilson Warbler, 10 miles out of the ocean off Gloucester, circling the boat, trying to land on the boat. Okay, for the oh, folks wow. on Zoom, that was a, a Wilson's Warbler 10 miles off the coast of Gloucester, England, correct? No. No, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that's well. That is fabulous. That's an amazing sight. And and back here, yes. I, I was over at Mont Montezuma Southern Man this morning, and uh, saw a lot of green winged teals around. Great. Okay, green winged teals out at Montezuma this morning. That's good to know. Um, and yeah, Tom. 69 wow. hermit thrushes banded it at wow at the banding station this morning that's amazing dominic there were a lot of birds yesterday morning at hannah included species uh, such as uh, white crown sparrow peregrine falcon uh, nashville warbler just to name a few wow white crown sparrow nashville warbler peregrine, peregrine falcon at high, high acres natural area yeah, this morning. That that's exciting. Yes. I had big yellow ones in my backyard right by my uh, bird bath. Oh, how cool. Yellow rumps in the backyard. I would love that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Why not? No, that's wonderful. Well, good. I'm glad to hear people are getting out and enjoying the fall and, and seeing some fun stuff. I envy you. I'm in the middle of writing a book. I'm not going outside now till December. So uh, but but Terrific to hear. Remember that Saturday is the global big, the global Stop. birding day. Yeah. Uh, so world birding day. So by all means, get out on Saturday, see something, even if it's just in your own backyard and post it to eBird to be part of part of the global experience of, of having a having a day that everybody's birding. I uh, want to tell you about some stuff that's coming up. Uh, we have some field trips this month. On uh, Saturday, this Saturday, we have a field trip to Batavia Wastewater Treatment Plant. Why do we go to wastewater treatment plants? Because they attract all kinds of birds. So the migrating waterfowl that are coming through from the north should be there. Should be lots of stuff to see. It uh, convenes at 9 a.m. Uh, it's Saturday, October 28th, Durand Eastman Park, also at 9 a.m., a very civilized hour to start birding. Um, that's, that's for the beginnings or the ends of the fall migrants and the beginnings of some of the birds that are going to hang out for the winter. So by all means, you know, take advantage of one of those. Uh, Birds and Brews is coming up next Wednesday. Uh, we're going to be at BJ's Restaurant and Brew House. That's the brand new place that just opened on Jefferson Road. So by all means, come and join us there. That's from six to nine. Uh, last, the last Birds and Brews, we had 17 people. So it's quite, quite the group. Uh, a lot of coming and going, but quite the group of people to hang out. And how often do you get to hang out and just talk about birds? So... Um, I wanna make sure you know that the Christmas bird count is coming up on Sunday, December 17th. So mark your calendar. All the information about that will be on our website very soon. So, uh, but, but you know, as an early warning, please mark that on your calendar. And next month's speaker will be, uh, let's see how good my French is, Jean-Francois Jean Thierrin. Uh, at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. He's a biologist there and he leads their research in the Arctic. So it should be a very interesting presentation. And that's next, next month on Thursday, November 9th. 
And with all of that, that's that's all the business I've got right now. So uh, I'll turn this over now to David to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Randy. Our speaker is highly recommended by our future speaker coming in April. So come back then. But his friend is uh, Andrew Farnsworth, also from Cornell, and he recommended Adrian Doctor to be our speaker. He joins us from uh, having study in the Netherlands, and of all things, he studies Dark Valley brands. And I had a nice conversation with him to tell him about the 18 that I found this afternoon. <clears throat> Briefly, he studies seasonal migration of birds from the continental scale movements of species of, to the fine scale behavior of individual flying through the atmosphere, uses weather networks as well as individual tags to address questions in migration ecology, including when and where birds migrate. He's an ecologist with a uh, background in physics and his research bridges disciplines in ecology, computer science, physics, and weather, addressing questions about effects of global change and the distribution and seasonal migrations of birds. He has an extensive curriculum vitae that I'm not going to describe to you. And this is just one page of six of his uh, <laughs> writings. So please welcome Adrian to our... Thank you. Thanks, and thanks very much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak here. Um, so my name is Adrian. Um, I'm originally from the, from Holland, from the Netherlands. Um, you may think of um, what is this physicist talking to you? Like I, I was also always a bird watcher from sort of a very young age, and um, that passion I couldn't let it go. So after my PhD, I did many many adventures and in in, in in all kinds of disciplines of ornithology. And uh, in 2006, I believe, or 2016, I I came here. I jumped over the ocean and started a job there at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, mostly working on, on large-scale migration of birds. Um, uh, the BirdCast project, I hope I won't steal uh, Andrew Sonder, but uh, he can figure that out later. Um, um, because uh, like, uh, and currently my, my job is to uh, I lead the air ecology team. Uh, it's a very small research team at the lab, mostly focused on migration and especially what happens at night. Um, so let, let's start with the night. Uh, if you think of all these, all these migratory birds in the US, there, there are so many uh, different breeding species. I'm, I'm still amazed at how colorful the birds here are in, in, in North America. But actually in, in all temperate latitudes, most of these species uh, are migratory. In fact, it's not a rare trait at all to be migratory. It's very common. Um, and of all these, all these billions of birds in our long, on, on their long journeys, all of these journeys almost happen at night. Like the, the, lo the vast majority of birds don't, you, you see migration during the day, but it just um, is sort of small compared to what happens at night. And, and that's, that's, for ecologists that really poses a problem, right? Because you can't, you can't really, it's not easy to follow if it all happens at night. Um, and why is that? I think that there's, there's multiple reasons why it's actually a very good idea to to migrate at night and birds, they really have their reasons for that. Uh, one is you can think of it's, it's when it's night, it's just sort of safe. We can see them, but they also cannot be seen. So it's really a good time to migrate in, in that respect. There's a lot of celestial cues like this, the, the moon, the stars, polarization patterns in the sky that, that birds use to, to orient themselves. So it's also a very information rich time, especially during the twilight periods when birds are starting their migration. There's a lot of information that helps them on their journeys. Nights also tend to be calm, you know, the, the sun is not there. You don't have the, the turbulence in the atmosphere that mixes everything up and that gives you like a bumpy ride. And typically it's a nicer, smoother travels at night. And maybe one that, that appeals to me the most, which I think is critical, like it's also just very time efficient because if you fly at night, you, you cannot really forage very easily. So if you if you fly at night, you can then refuel during the day and, and sleep during the day and, and hide. It's, it's just a very efficient way of spending your time. And, and birds are therefore very uh, clever like that. 
which brings me now sort of to the birth of my research field, which is called maybe arrow ecology. It's like there's not we have one arrow ecology meeting uh, every two years, and then it's like there's maybe fifty arrow ecologists. It's a it's a quite a small field, um, um, but it's a very nice field, and and we really study migration of birds, um, mostly with radar, really the active flight and uh, the active when birds are actively um, going from A to B. And I think the birth of the birth of this field sort of goes back to David Leck, very famous ornithologist uh, from Britain and George Varley. They were sort of in the military during the Second World War um, and they they saw these sort of what they called angels on their radar screens, which were which were sort of unexplained radar blips. And and if you dig into this old paper, which is an, a very old nature paper that they published right after the war when they were got clearance to publish this, because radar technology is always like secret and you cannot it had, it had to be sort of state um, secret that that like birds had given to several e bird scares and at least one invasion alarm so that of course people at some point realized okay these are actually birds and radar can detect birds that was not something that was obvious um and even now it's like when i talk now now i think a lot of the tools we use are weather radars it has also quite it's taken a lot of effort to, for us to realize no all these things we see at night they're really almost entirely birds and we can use we also weather radars to study bird migration at night. So I mentioned already weather radars, these, these huge towers. We have about 143 of them in the lower 48. Um, they're very expensive to operate, of course, but, but they are there also for just as a public surface to monitor severe weather, hurricanes, tornadoes. They have a very special function like that. But they're also wildlife surveillance radars, if you like. And, um, can be used to track to track migration and and have uh, this network. So the way a radar works, it sends out a radar pulse. That's the the radio detection and ranging. It's an acronym. Um, so that detection is basically the, the 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 radio wave goes out at the speed of light, bumps against the bird, comes back at the speed of light. So sort of the travel time at the speed of light you can measure, and that gives you sort of the distance at what at which that object is. And then you have the dish to sort of say, okay, where was that? So these radars, they scan around continuously. Every five minutes, they make a complete sweep of the airspace and then send that to, um, to the computers um, and, and send, send the data to us basically for, for analysis. Um, so the, that looks sort of, the raw data looks sort of like this. Um, so you see these blooms as I call them, sort of these circular things around each radar blip. Um, so this, you see this front here moving of precipitation to the left, and then all of a sudden you see all these blooms appear. That's basically at sunset, uh, when all the birds, uh, at sunrise, probably, at, su uh, at, at sunset, obviously they migrate at night, um, you see all these blooms appearing, uh, those are the birds. So there's a lot of going on in these in these radar images, and um, the really exciting thing about these radar data is these archives go way back, um, 25 years at, at least. Um, they cover the whole of the U.S. Uh, and very high time resolution. Also, every five min minutes we have such a sample of what happens in this in the night sky. You might feel wise with radar air ecology is still such a young field. I mean, these are uh, these archives are 25 years long. What's behind it really is also the sort of the revolution in in internet computational power, sort of the Googles and Amazons in the world that now host these data and that allows me to come in and just grab like thousands of their computers, process the data, get the birds out, and actually start start doing ecology ecological research with it. Like only like 10 years ago, that wasn't possible. Like the data sets are so large that we couldn't really, they were sitting in the dungeons of the meteorologists, but we couldn't do anything with it. Um, so that has changed a lot. So, so if you now go to uh, the BirdCast website, I mean, that's a lot of, my, who knows about BirdCast? Uh, mo most people do it good. So if if you go now to that website, I mean, it's, it's you have sort of these these uh, nocturnal 
real-time information about word migration, which are sort of a, a more simplified and sort of better tailored way than these raw data images I just showed you. Uh, makes it easier for you to look at. So we extract the birds, get rid of the rain, um, and estimate the speed and direction of the birds, um, and give you these products. And I, I may want to dive a little bit into that. So a lot of what we actually do is like going from this whole complex radar data to something more simple. So we, we start with these radar images. The radar gives us information about biomass. They, you don't see individual birds in this bloom, for example. It's more like how dense is it? So it's a measure of the biomass in the air. I mean, we cannot see the individuals really. And then there's also a velocity field that gives you uh, a Doppler velocity that tells us something about the direction of the birds. Um, so that makes you really think, hey, how do we get these numbers on birdcast? You know, we have to assume we, we, we measure the amount of meat or the amount of biomass in the air, but we have to sort of assume like, okay, how much does one bird to how much biomass does that correspond? So we, we now use like 11 square centimeters as the, as the size that came once from a study we did in Europe. Um, and, and that's sort of like our, our, our conversion of the sort of reflectivity of the radars to uh, numbers of birds. So we start with these images, then those are sort of collapsed in what we call a vertical profile. So here's a, quite a nice one where you see as a function of time and altitude, the, we sort of summarize all the complexity in the data and get them the density over time and their speed and direction. So this is a very nice case where you see this high altitude layer of migration form uh, that often happens when birds are clever again, like I'm always amazed by them. Like for example, if there's like bad headwinds low in the sky and but then there's a really nice tailwind at two, three kilometers height, that's that's a situation like this. And that's why I don't know how, the, how they sense it, but they know mm, if I just keep climbing to two, four kilometers, then I have the good tailwind. And that's why you that's why when you get these layers uh, in the night sky. Um, so yeah, this is the vertical profile. We extract that automatically for all the radars all the time in real time in the Amazon cloud. Um, we can summarize that further, right? You can vertically integrate the data, just add all the vert birds over the altitude column together. Then you just get the numbers of birds over time. Um, and you can even uh, summarize that further as like someone average number of birds that passed over the radar in the night. And then the images that you see in BirdCast are sort of, yeah, we did a lot of summary of the data for all these radars. So we have the sort of point measurements of radar bird density uh, at each station every five minutes, uh, like this. And then we just sort of smooth and interpolate that out so that we get a contiguous image uh, of migration over the US. Um, so yeah, if you if you animate that, for example, for a few uh, nights like this, you really see these waves of migration coming from the north going over the country. Um, so uh, it's quite nice to look at. And it's not just, it's not maybe a traditional wave. It's also like really what you see is the good and the bad weather move over the country as like the of the weather systems come typically from the west towards the east so whenever there's a nice uh, clear weather situation that that's when you get all the birds and that gives sort of this appearance of uh, of migration waves um, so that was a big night there now another really big thing that we do at birdcast is um, um, doing forecasts of migration uh, and we'll give a big shout out also to Benjamin Van Doren and Kyle Horton. They're both, uh, we're also postdocs at the uh, Lab of Ornithology. They both have now moved on to their own research labs, Kyle in uh, Colorado State and Benjamin in uh, Illinois starting this year. Uh, yeah. they've, done, they've been on a, a lot of the initial development and uh, of these, of these um, birdcast migration models. And the way they work, um, is with like using sort of computer learning um, in, in, in the following, we have, we have 25 years of radar data and, and that's a lot of examples every five minutes. So what we do is uh, take those 
measurements of birds and speeds and directions, and then associate them with a weather forecast model that gives you the temperature, the wind, you know, everything about the atmosphere. And you let then let the computer learn the associations between the weather, uh, temperature, and all, all things that are not birds with what the radars have observed. And then these new computer machine learning models that are sort of, um, yeah, tree-based models, um, they're also behind, they're similar in, in design, like these things like Ch Ch GPT that you hear about, you know, also regression tree models that are maybe a little bit more complex, but they're all over the sciences nowadays. These, mo these methods are super efficient at learning uh, these associations between weather and birds. And then if you give the model then a new, just a regular weather forecast that you can get from a meteorologist that goes like, they say two, three, five days out, it gives you the forecasted wind and precipitation, but the, the model has learned what kind of bird migration goes with that. And then that gives you this forecast of migration to the future. So you have the model trained. The only thing that it needs is the weather forecast about the meteorology, and then it gives you the birds. And it, it works surprisingly well. Um, so that means that we have these paired now. We have the forecast uh, here, for example, is one, one example of last of May 2022. This was what it was observed at sort of that same peak time. And you see there's a very nice uh, correspondence uh, generally. Oh yeah, this one I still stuck like in because uh, only a few day, days ago we had our first uh, multi-billion bird flight on bird cost this year. We brought we, over the, like four years now that we're doing this, we never went over eight nine hundred million birds at the same time in flight. Um, this was the first time we crossed the one billion uh, mark. So the very good uh, conditions for migration you see there, especially in the southeast. Um, so yeah, the forecast and alerts gives us also the ability, um, um, these are these very large scale metrics, right? And but over the last few years, we spent quite a lot of time to make these things maybe more local, locally relevant for you like bird watchers or other people who want to use these data uh, for other applications. I'll talk a bit more about that soon, but you can go, and look at local uh, forecasts and alerts. And only like about two years ago, we added also the migration uh, dashboard. Um, I'm not sure, no, it's not, not getting it. Uh, so the dashboard is really also, a, it's basically a tool that lets you drill into these live migration data that we have. Um, so really, if you haven't checked that out yet on the BirdCast web website, I encourage you to do it. It's kind of fun. I'm, I'm looking at that every night. Uh, to see what happens in my county. And so you, you basically fill in your county and then you get the live radar data summarized for you. And what's especially nice is that it gives you also the historical background. So what do the migration patterns look like based on the 20 years of data historically? Um, so you have the green line and the gray. Uh, so that allows you to see oh, well, how was this night different from sort of the, the, the historical patterns. and really allows you also to see how, what was it a really high migration night in my county or not? Because that matters where you are, right? If I, to me, like in like a million birds over Tompkins County where I live is huge. But if you would go to Houston or Dallas in Texas in the spring, that, that would be nothing, you know? So it really, there, there's different um, relative levels of what, what means, what, 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 it, what it means to be, peak migration or high migration. So that really allows you to explore that very nicely. Um, so the use of that data, I think what we've really focused on so far is in terms of applications of these birds cast data is a lot around the problem of uh, artificial light at night. Um, and I, unfortunately last, I think this was the sixth of October, I'm not sure you heard about it, it was in, in Chicago. We had it again at the McCormick building. It's a big convention center at the Lake Shore there. Uh, was what, really one of the worst um, nights they've ever had. It's like almost a thousand birds uh, or over a thousand birds killed in just a single night, which makes you think, okay, how many birds 
were hit, um, you know, all along the lake shore right, right there. And um, um, yeah, what I what we hope with Birdcast is that you know we are able to message around these big migration nights and um, for someone like certain buildings, it might be costly or impossible to do that every night to turn out your light. But if we are effective at messaging these peak nights, um, then you can sort of narrow the window in which you have to do something. Um, so that would be that would be a good thing. In this case, what happened, um, so we had again, very strong migration uh, right around here. And that's something we see more and more. It's not just a strong migration. There was also a front here that hang over um, over the lake. And if you drill deeper into the radar data here, this is a little complex to look at, but maybe this one is a good figure. In red, it's a metrology, these dual polarization metrics. Uh, modern radars are kind of good at distinguishing birds and precipitation, which we use a lot also in the getting rid of rain. But so you see in the, in the red, you see the rain and the blue is the birds. So you really see them crushing in there. And that, that's, we see more and more. Like when, you know, it's not just ton of migration. It's also like once their precipitation, they get disoriented or they might get wet or they might, and there might be bad visibility. And, and that's when they sort of start to get disoriented, get attracted to the lights and, and collide. Um, yeah, one of the extreme examples that um, every year that we have uh, is also at, at the Tribute of Light in, uh, in New York City. Um, to commemorate, um, you know, the 9-11 victims. And it's a very impressive display. Um, uh, but also, of course, it's in the middle of the migration season. Um, so it typically leads to very strong attraction of birds to these uh, uh, to these light beams. This year was also very um, good. But the, the, there's a good collaboration with the New York Audubon and uh, so the light beams are monitored, and whenever there's over a thousand birds in them, they shut it down, and then the the birds are able to uh, uh, to escape. So this is what it looks like in such an uh, extreme situation. Um, so all those little dots were actually flying birds, uh, not insects. Um, and if you then animate that you see, um, this is the radar image over lower Manhattan. So you see this big blob here appearing and that's when the lights are on. And whenever the light is then switched off, you see the blob disappear again. So a very, very quick response. So that also tells you it's quite easy to do something about this. You just need to, um, once you remove the light source, the, the attraction is pretty much gone. Um, so a lot of, um, yeah. I think Andrew, who's coming in April, will tell you maybe more about this. Uh, so I'll be brief uh, about this now. But we have a lot of a pilot project in Texas, especially, where there was a lot of buy-in, also from the mayor, to wanting to do something about it and declarations to have uh, lights out nights. And we're trying to get buy-in from building owners to, to turn off their lights, uh, especially during these peak migration nights. Um, I now want to switch gears a little bit, maybe also think a bit about um, what's new with BirdCast. And one, one new thing we have been uh, thinking about is, uh, and there's a work by my postdoc, Rafael Nussbaumer. Um, he's from Switzerland and has been with us for two years, um, just returned a few months ago um, back to Switzerland. Um, very talented postdoc. And he has been thinking about migration more as really as a, bio, as a flow of biomass that moves over uh, over the landscape. So the, you see here these arrows that indicate the direction of the flow. And then if you look carefully, you see sort of these hotspots of biomass and then you sort of see the move north throughout. Now here's a nice one. See where you really see that blob move throughout the night to the north. Um, so, by sort of modeling these biomass flows in more detail, really almost as a as a hydrological flow, you can sort of keep track of like what takes off and what comes to the ground. Because that's always our challenge with radar. Like, okay, what does it mean 
that we have a, a, a night of a million birds flying over my head. But did it mean that they all left or did they all arrive? Like that can mean very different things for what, what actually changes on the ground. And that's why sometimes it's not intuitive to relate a huge migration night to a changes you see around you in the field. So we really want to get closer to that and make that connection with like what changes on the ground more explicit. And so you can use these fluid mechanical models. And it sort of works like this, that you have the migration, which is um, scanned by the radar um, on a certain time step. So we get a snapshot of where the birds are. Um, and then we also measure the speed of the birds. So we can sort of, given their speed, we can sort of predict where they should be, like say 10 minutes later, when we're gonna do another sweep. So we propagate the birds that we measured at time is zero, time is one, 10 minutes into the future. And then we compare it, what we actually measured 10 minutes later. And then you can compare the difference uh, between the two. So you might see, at certain regions, there's more birds observed than our model predicted. That means, okay, they must have dropped to the ground in that pixel. While in another pixel near forest, we actually all of a sudden see more birds than we had before. So then they must have taken off there. So in that way, you can sort of infer indirectly what these movements of the birds were towards the ground and, and into the sky. So that sort of like this is the direction of what we're thinking for maybe new bird cost products in the future that connect you closer to what changes on the ground. So here you see these estimates uh, on the lower left of the departure and the lower right of the arrival for each night. So you see um, blue is where the birds took off and, and red is where they come to the ground. The top is where they move in the air. Um, it's not always very easy to see, but you see there's a, typically the birds move, they land more north than from where they took off, right? And that kind of makes sense. Um, so let's go, for example, to uh, this figure. Where you have now for a series of nights in red, like this is where they took off and in blue, that's where they came to the ground. So it's not always very clear because, um, it really depends on how they how they departure. But for example, in these cases, it's quite clear that you can see sort of the average distance that the birds have flown from sort of the difference between their takeoff and their landing. Um, so you're able to quantify that also uh, like this. So in, if you think of it in one dimension, you could think of like the birds taking off like this Gaussian shape of like, I'm using too much jargon here. I mean, just think of this blob as the birds moving through the air and taking off and coming to the ground, right? That means like if you would then, after the, the departure means like in the beginning, you get fewer birds that are on the ground and further to the right, the birds land. So their birds are added to the ground, which we indicate here in blue. So here you see that the birds arrive. So you could sort of, show that in this graph like and uh, and sort of the main point is like it sort of depends on like over what region do birds leave uh, so in the in the top if there's a very localized departure of birds from a small region and they fly a little to the north then you might have very clear regions where there's a lot a large net departure and somewhere else there's a real arrival sort of like a migration wave that arrives. So all of a sudden there's more birds. But there might also be a regime like, well, if birds depart everywhere at the same time and then fly a few hundred kilometers and then land everywhere, that's more the bottom situation. And then you kind of have often the fact that like almost everywhere, there's just as many birds left as are arrived. And so we sort of, in this study, we asked the question, okay, where are we typically? Are we much more in the, that regime that we call um, on the top of which we call the wave regime, or is it more like a stream, like the stream of a river where there's not really, you know, birds are moving, but there's not like a real density change on the ground. Um, so we did that for the whole archive, analyzed that. And um, I think what we find is like, so that metric that we have, like if you were around 73%, you would have more the wave regime 
around 50 percent it's more the stream regime and and this is what the truth is based on all our historical radar data um, so you see we're very much in this stream regime where often birds take off and and birds land and there's there's not really a change on the ground and that's that often it's often a question i get like hey there was like a huge movement on birdcast but i went out and i didn't see any difference you know well that might actually be true you know there is not a difference in the number of birds but they're definitely they're all new there are a lot of new birds um, so it's more that sort of turnover id instead of that it's like waves and increases in numbers um, that you often have the waves do happen but they're they're just not as common yeah so thinking about the birdcast i'm really thinking about oh this is maybe something nice to add at some point to have more, not just what the most of her had, but what, what's actually a change on the ground and what are the numbers that arrived and, the, and, and left for your, for your county. Um, I want to talk a little bit also about um, other sort of analysis that you can do with the radar data. And, and what you see here happening in this figure is sort of a cumulative I'm sort of adding the passage of each of the nights together into like one grand average for a whole spring. Um, and what sort of is very apparent from this figure is like um, the white in this case is the more birds. Uh, for spring, you see this sort of central flyway through the Midwest, um, through the corn belt of the, and then sort of through the, through the Great Plains. It's often not the habitats that you think of, like, oh, is that where I go birding? Uh, but that is actually like a huge numbers of birds go through there. And where we live in New York, it's kind of dwarfed by what you have in Ohio. Like, well, it's not often what, how you think of uh, bird migration. It's again, this misleading thing about there can be huge passage, but it's not always, you, you not always see it. Um, so like this sort of cumulative passage, you can, you, we can do that every year, right? And you can sort of look how has that passage over the US, how has that changed? Um, so we did that a few years ago as part of the three billion birds lost paper that um, I, um, my friend and colleague Ken Rosenberg led. And um, where that also had a radar component where we looked with radar in the night sky, what, what has actually changed? Um, so this is sort of looks at that change in spring passage for each station uh, over this, in this case, an 11 year period. Um, and anything that's red shows a decline, blue is a potential increase. And it's, it's quite obvious that um, a lot of the stations are red. Um, and it's especially significant uh, in this sort of eastern half of the country and the, and the central part. That's where there's a very clear signal of, the, of decline. Um, now you can also combine trend and passage, like sort of the trend with like how many birds are passing over to sort of have the lost birds, like where's the most migration lost. Uh, if you do it like that, then you see it's sort of in the Midwest again, there's the, the largest loss of migration. Also because there are so many birds moving there. so. If you have a few percent decline per year, that that really adds up. Um, so by 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 flyways, on average, it's like fourteen uh, percent since two thousand seven. It's about a rate of decline of like one two percent. That sounds small, but it really adds up over many many years. And uh, yeah, make makes us really think um, what that means because a radar isn't it, it's not your um, um, you know, your um, it doesn't really measure rare birds. Um, we are often concerned about our, our rare birds and the Kirtland warblers in the world, and uh, uh, the kinetic wood warblers in the in the world. But the radar doesn't really measure those. There's so few of them, uh, and the fact that the radar measures such a clear signal means that it, it must affect sort of our common, very abundant birds. Like it's just the magnitude of migration. And, ma and migration is a mass phenomenon that's sort of in decline. Um, and that, that's concerning and it, and it lined up what we found also for all these species specific studies. Um, a lot of it was based on the breeding bird survey where you actually do see like the, the common birds, the common migratory birds that are actually in, 
in steepest decline. And that sort of mess, uh, ma uh, matters, right? Because, um, yeah, the lab of ornithology has this statue in front of the building of the passenger pigeon. So it has that reminder that like common birds can go uh, extinct as well. And it's just more, I think there's real value in that just that mass phenomenon of migration. I think that in itself is something precious and 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 amazing. And and we we should really work to sort of halt these decline of common birds as well. And I think it's important to for conservation also to to think about and and be concerned about um, about our common birds. Yeah, keep on common birds common it has been the model, the logo or the motto of the partners in flight a, a big sort of grouping of organizations concerned about micro rivers for a very long time so that that really matches um yeah maybe a little bit yeah like the drivers of these bird declines i think we know pretty much what's behind it it's it, it the habit loss by by is a really large factor and that's then compounded by sort of environmental change and climate change. Um, so you might say, oh, is this a sort of, a, um, and there, there's human cause mortality, of course, as well. That's more easy and directly to, we, are we able to quantify that? Um, so you might say, oh yeah, we know why bird declines are happening. It's a little bit of how you ask the question because it's also a very complicated question. I mean, there's all these different things and especially for migratory birds, it's very hard to say, okay, but it's this thing. Like, if you want to do something, you sort of want to say, okay, it's this thing, and it, and we should sort of do something here. So it's you want to be able to say, all along these flyways of these migratory birds, like where do they need most help? And and that question, I would say, almost for any migratory birds, we we don't really know. We don't even we don't really know is the problem in the winter? Is it in the summer? Is it during breeding? Is it during the survival? Is it during migration where they have most issues? Or is it just everything? So it's a really simple question and, and it's sort of like a testament to our field um, we, that we still have a long way to go to sort of get more specific and uh, answering these questions. Um, there are some good examples of a few species where we know, um, but uh, a lot not. Um, so we, I, I thought a bit about also to think about this question of like causes and, and limitation of populations in the context also of uh, the radar work. And that might surprise you because like, radar doesn't even look at species. So we're gonna really zoom out now uh, again, which I like to do. Um, and uh, you know, you can ask these questions like with the, like with the decline we see um, of migratory birds, in the passage of the radar is that now is that mostly because like that they have problems in the breeding or the wintering area we we don't really know and you can also look at that in the fluctuations that we see from year to year so sometimes you see like some years there's more birds all of a sudden than other years is that because they had very good sur uh winter over winter survival or was there very many young birds born it can be sort of both and we would really like to be able to tease that apart and I like this sort of tap versus top analogy that uh, people have proposed in the pot. So the, the population level of the birds is the, the water level. And, you know, the, the water level can change, but that can be either because you change how much water goes in, how many young birds are being born, but it can also be like someone pulls the plug and, and it's just how many birds are dying and something changes there. And I think our task is really to answer like we, okay which one of the which one is it um so you can do a little bit with that also with the with a the very large macro scale of like the avifauna as a whole which we study with radar networks so you can make these imaginary transects and you can draw over the us and then, and then us is nice it has like a c on one end a c on the other end radars all over so that you can sort of make this sort of fence or like line that they it doesn't really matter where they cross it but we will catch them basically and count them over these lines um, so that's what we do uh, and then you uh, get about to these really big numbers of like three and a half billion birds coming into the u.s along the southern border and about two and a half billion uh, going out um, 
So now if I were to repeat this exercise in the fall, uh, anyone want to guess how many words uh, are coming back uh, from Canada? We had 2.5 billion going north. Any Any guesses? Four? I, let's see. Uh, that's very good. <laughs> we have a real somewhat insight here. Um, but yeah, it makes sense, right? That there's more because like there, um, there's all the young birds are being added to the population. So you would have expected to have more birds there. Um, when I did this for the first time, I really had no idea because there's a lot of uncertainty actually in this post fletching period, right? Birds, there's a lot, like often birds fletch like five or six young. So there's a potential for a huge burst. Um, but then we know that like the fletching mortality is also very high. So we mostly measure here at the radar how many actually made it onto migration. Um, so yeah, and we go from 2.5 to four and in the South as well. But uh, the interesting thing is that this, you. You can almost think of this as a as a measure of reproduction, right? But then at the ever fauna scale, like we have this many birds going in, this many come back, that sort of as a measure of reproductive success. Or we have this many birds leaving the US, we have this money coming back, and that's a sort of a, a measure of survival for all birds combined. Um, so you can look at that and sort of start to partition the, the numbers that we count with the radar in sort of two steps. So the change from one spring to the next, it can be decomposed in a, in a step from spring to autumn, which is a measure of recruitment, if you want, and from autumn to spring, which is a, a measure of survival or, of, or mortality. And then you can test, okay, we, the fluctuations that we see in the, in the numbers, are they now mostly driven by what happened in the first step or in the second step? Um, so... It really turns out that a lot of the fluctuations we see are happening in the sort of autumn to spring step. So that's sort of the winter. And the way I think it, it might be, there's a, we measure a lot of like birds that winter in the US with the, net, with the radar network. There's a lot of birds that winter in Texas and in the south there that we're measuring here. Um, yeah, they might be just sensitive to you, like harsh winters. And, and that seems to be here more driving the fluctuations than like very good, very poor breeding success um, um, based on that. I'm also working on, um, with a postdoc now on sort of doing these sort of same exercises, but then with eBER data um, and um, to sort of try to think about, oh, can we use the same principle of like snapshotting birds that eBirders have seen in the spring and then also in the fall and so use the ratios that people have measured to get an estimate of uh, reproduction and mortality. It's an uh, ambitious project. I think we're getting actually quite good results already with certain uh, species. And um, it really gives you to think like, so uh, yeah, I want sort of to close with like, okay, it's gonna be a um, big day again on Saturday. I'm definitely gonna go out. Um, there's real value in, in reporting your observations and, uh, and um, bringing that information into a database so that we can do this research. A lot of trend data has come, has come out also of the eBird project recently. Um, and also for the WordCast project, you can expect to see more and more integration of your eBird data also into the migration projects that we have on WordCast uh, to sort of bring you more also that, um, that information on the, on the species. So with that, I want to end and I wanted to thank uh, the BirdCast team, uh, the Macrodemography project team that I've been working with and, uh, and for your attention, of course. Thank you. Do we have, anybody have questions? Questions? The elevation of the birds has come up when we talk about wind farms being yeah. placed near the lake and up there. And some people are saying some species migrate much higher than them. 
and it's not a problem for them, but other things like, I'm just talking off the top of my head, owls and uh, certain kinds of hawks come in quite low yeah. and are going to be damaged more by wind farms. Does turning off wind farms the way you do turn off lights at certain times Yeah, I think that's help? a great opportunity. Yeah, and, and it's definitely we have a project actually on on uh, offshore wind farms where we try to use the weather radars to look over the offshore areas in the U.S. It's sometimes challenging because the farther the even if you look with a radar close to the ground, the the earth beats you because the earth just curves down because it's a globe. So the further you get, the beam always goes up, even if you shoot the beam like horizontally over the earth. Um, so it's hard to look very close to the ground, but we are doing pretty well. And um, no, I think you're totally right. It, it is an issue. And, and I think it could be a power of BirdCast to just, you know, we want to make more tools so that maybe a wind farmer could just very easily tap into the BirdCast data and just shut down the wind farm when he really needs to because that's there's the same conflict as with the lights right they don't want to turn it off because then you don't have the energy but if you calculate um kyle did a nice paper on that if you calculate um it's only a few nights you know that but where 50 birds of the percent of the birds pass so you can be quite specific and often like on nights that are very good for wind farms with lots of wind are often not the nights that birds don't like to migrate with a ton of wind. Um, so I, I do think there's definitely opportunities for wind farm curtailment. Um, yeah, you have to get buy-in from these wind farmer companies and it probably has to be regulation also. And there will be a long process, but um, I think it's important and there's good, there is good solutions. Um, so yeah, we're looking now at like how many birds are flying through these or rotor swept zones trying to estimate that and um i think we're with birdcast and with weather radars you're really focusing on the passerine birds i think they are typically flying a little bit higher um they go all the way up to several kilometers um i think like really in the offshore environment like gulls and like skuas and like um, petrels and those kind of things there they'll be very low to the ground and you you cannot see them with the radar um but yeah, we'll be able to say something for the um, for the songbirds, and then try to at least give sort of some windows already and some areas where there's a lot of offshore migration, so that and that at least is known uh, also in terms of sighting decisions for these wind farms. It's really amazing, like how much development there's going to be uh, in the offshore environment. So yeah. And on land as well, actually, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. So I, I was just going to ask if um, if you were taking account of areas where um, there are stopover sites as opposed to areas where the birds are maybe taking longer flights. Because I know in Rochester, we are known to be a stopover area. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of flying in and flying out. Um Interestingly enough, that that impacted sighting of wind turbines too. But I was just sort of more um, talking about are are you seeing differences in terms of patterns and where the birds are actually landing? Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's very interesting, and it's sort of like taking bird, the birdcast data and, and radar data in general to like this fine scale resolution really and the radar has a lot of information there but as you said all the tools on birdcast now are they still treat the radars as sort of points and we interpolate between those points so the, the data looks sort of fine scale but in, to be totally honest it's not not fully fine scale because we still you know the the radars are 100 kilometers apart um, so there's a huge opportunity there because the radars does see a lot of patterns of stopover um, and you see stopover, especially maybe after the fact. So in the morning, in, during takeoff, birds take off in a very synchronized way about like an hour after sunset. And in that short window, 
they take off from their habitat and then in that short window they st sort of still hang above the forest and the areas where they took off so you can get a sort of very nice snapshot there of uh, which areas did we see birds take off at that moment um, so it would be really nice if we get more of that information accessible as well there's still a lot of methodological issues also because like Again, the earth curvature of the earth, the beam shape that changes. So we need to do a lot of corrections on um, making those images really nicely interpretable, but there's a lot of progress there. So I do expect to see more and more, more of that, that we can get to do these stop over patterns. The other way around to really see where birds are landing. So it's easy to see where they depart. It's more difficult to see where they land because that happens over the whole night. And you have this huge biomass that flies over. So with the methodology that I talked about, uh, departure and takeoff, we can we can get to some of that. Um, but I'm not sure it will be fine enough at a, like a real forest patch region. Um, but yeah, there there's a lot of opportunities there. Yeah. I have another question actually, and and it is um, as you said, you have 25 years of data, but I assume the radar is getting better. So is the data getting better as oh, those yeah. years go on? And does that mean anything for you? Uh, so the question was if the radar is getting better and that therefore our data is getting better. Um, yeah, the radar has become a lot better, especially around 2013. And that was when the radars got upgraded to dual polarization. Um, this just makes it much easier to distinguish uh, meteorological things from, from biological things. Um, since then, they're kind of sort of stable um, and we're sort of waiting for maybe the next upgrade in like 10, 15 years. Um, it's also a good thing if things are stable because then you can actually look at these long-term trends, right? So there have been a few breakpoints in that 25 year period. like the dual polarization upgrade was one. There was also upgrades in like that they got better at filtering clutter by having Doppler filtering and and then when I did this trends analysis, that's why I didn't go back so far with that. And it's like, oh yeah, but then I knew the radar also changed. So is the changes that I see, are they due to the birds or is it due to the due to the radar? So there are some challenges there. Um, yeah, there will be again a big radar upgrade. And then, yeah, we have to see what that will look like. And it will be to probably a totally different radar again and probably some solid state radar. And I think people will want to combine like air traffic surveillance and weather radars maybe into one to save uh, costs. But it will be a multi-billion project. It has to be approved by Congress first. It's just still quite far, yeah. So much in this summer, there is always possible. We have rules. Huh? There has always been a lot of interest in birds in Europe. Is there? Um, radar data in Europe where people are trying to measure the same things you are. Yeah, is that happening? Yeah. yeah, I mean that's where that's where my career started. I like the like one of these the first profile algorithm that was being made. Like that was my first postdoc when I was at uh, the Netherlands Red Meteorological Institute. I was really working on these methods to get the birds out. So Europe got a little bit head start, and then. Um, very quickly, over a few years, there the U.S. is a real advantage, and that enticed me also to come here for research, but also just for the um, and just the experience of living in another country. Um, you have just this huge homogeneous network of like, and everything is nicely archived for like twenty five years. Well, if I want to do something like that in Europe, like each country has their own data standard, and they have their own radar settings, and their everything. And everybody and nobody wants to sort of make it all the same. So it's a real challenge to do something at the large scale. Um, we are getting, making a lot of progress. There's the European network for the radar surveillance for animal migration. Um, and there's also the OPERA program, which is the collaboration between all the net offices, the meteorological offices in Europe to standardize things. But it goes slowly and it's, um, uh, it's just the way humans work because you might think like, why is Canada not on BirdCast? And that's, you know, that's only one extra country. And uh, already that's such a hard step to, you know, then we have two data streams and, and there's two data formats. And 
So we've been working on it for quite a few years to make progress there, but it's just hard to collaborate. And it's not just us as researchers, there has to be data policy agreements and open data sharing, and some countries make money of their radar data. So there's a lot that needs to happen. And there's a lot of high level policy decisions as well. But um, I do think Canada will come. <laughs> I mean, they want to, and we want to also collaborate very much. The, um, the um, major flyway uh, across the US seems to be correlated with an area of relatively low, low light pollution. Do you see that correlation in major flyways across Europe? Um, so, or is that just yeah? I think yeah, that's a good question. Um, there is definitely like a lot of attraction to light, but I think it's sort of um, Jeff Bueller has done a lot of uh, studies on this, and he looks more at these fine scale habitat things during takeoff, for example. And then some analysis that he found is like yes, there is. There is sort of like an attraction and also a repulsion of this light at night. So it might draw birds into like a light city and might want them to stop over there, but then they still search the dark places to stop over and sit in a dark city park, for example. Um, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's more fine skill where the attraction happens. Yeah. And so when they, at the end of the night, they might sort of be attracted to it. And, and I think those patterns of migration, there's a big loop migration happening in the US where birds come up through the central flyway and then they move more towards the east and they also depart on the on the eastern part of the of the Gulf. That's where the departure is while they come in in the spring much more through Texas on the Western Gulf. Those are very old patterns that have evolved over millions of years. And I think that has always been there. Um, it's more like that fine scale local disturbances that the light gives and that is problematic, yeah. With so many birds migrating at night, how easy is it for the general public to go out and watch them? You know, kind of have a, a, a bonfire and some friends over and we go. Oh, watch yeah, them. yeah. Well, you can have your birdcast app off and then you can see like, oh, <laughs> that, I mean, that's what we do try to do with like these tools to help have the radar help you to see it. But I think a really nice thing to do is just um, well, just to listen. I mean, that's the best thing. It is quite exciting to go listen to nocturnal flight calls. And um, I mean, there's a huge opportunity there, of course, too. Uh, with like, there's a lot of development there. I think Benjamin Van Doren is working on that a lot now. Uh, he's just starting his own lab um, in, um, in in Illinois to sort of automatically detect these flight calls. That would be a very cool additional data resource because that would give you information on species as well. Um, but yeah, look at your flight map and at the radar and then especially when are they sort of low because it's like if the if the migration is very high, I've tried very often, very often, to listen on the biggest nights, and then I just heard nothing because they're just too high up. Mm. Um, but yeah, again, sort of cloudy conditions or like a little drizzle is good, and then you have like it's amazing how many flight calls you can hear, and especially with all these thrushes and the swains and thrushes are easy to hear. And I, I don't understand where they come from because I don't see so many strange thrushes, but it's by far the most common bird you hear at night. Yeah. You know? Got a got a question for you on for your um, bird cast, and you're talking about the uh, uh, you know the takeoff and the landing, or uh, what kind of granularity do you have right now, and for where the, do you see it going? How 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 fine a granularity do you think you can get to? Yeah, I think I think those. Uh, departure takeoffs and I, was, I think the grid is about 20 kilometers now so um, but then I'm not sure I think it can get finer so like we need to make this transition to you so that it's still based the the flow model is still based on these interpolations between the radar stations where all the data was collapsed into a point like we need to get rid of that and then really use the fine scale information of the radar that is like one or two kilometers, and then maybe we can get even finer. 
um, but it will be a huge step. And also like the computing infrastructure and we're doing these back on the envelope calculations now for like, oh, what would it take? And how much storage do we need? And um, yeah, that's still quite some years away, I think. But I mean, we're working on the methods to do that, yeah. There was an unprecedented number of wildfires in central and eastern Canada. Yeah. Um, where a lot of our breeding birds go. Are we starting to see a, a decline in like eBird lists um, from uh, migrating birds this fall? Yeah. So the question was like, what about all these wildfires and have they have an effect on uh, migration and is there lower migration numbers? I'm not sure, but uh, um, one of my colleagues is, is trying to look into that uh, also with the radar to see, do we see different um, different numbers of migration? Um, so yeah, stay tuned. I, I think, I think I'm not sure. Um, and there's definitely, we definitely see a lot of migration through the smoke. So that, that was quite clear. There were, so even in the quite dense smoke events, migration does continue. Um, I'm not sure how bad that is. And it will be especially be interesting also to look at, there's quite good smoke products now that come out of satellites so that you could maybe compare do birds change their flight altitude to avoid these smoke layers because it, can be quite uncomfortable, I, I presume, to have that sort of high exercise in these very bad um, air conditions. And there has been another study recently that I was not involved with that showed, based on eBird data, that there was a correlation between um, air quality and bird numbers. So that in regions with like that air pollution itself had sort of a bad effect on, on numbers of breeding birds. So that there might be that that might be a factor, yeah, for for birds. Thank you so much. Right. For being You're welcome.